just say a couple of words on behalf of the uh, Colombian community. We are very appreciative that uh, Venice was here today. In fact, the policy of the committee has been that we don't invite our local people to be from <laughs> here, sure. and we stuck to that. But we've had a number of cancellations because of weather and also other cancellations today for other reasons. And, and this, on the other hand, this, this turned out to be a wonderful opportunity for Glenn to present something new because this is a new model. Uh, done in collaboration with Glenys' former and present students, which people talk a lot about, and uh, it's, it's great that you won't hear uh, and, and to, to give this talk so we get to hear. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's, it's, I'm really extremely uh, pleased about this. It's like the significance of it has only gradually sunk in as I've been giving talks in more and more places, and people are really amazed that it turned out to be possible. And now, it, now that I think, it's one of those things, I think, where they say, uh, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. I think maybe if I had not been really a particle physicist, sort of semi-masquerading as an astrophysicist, uh, I wouldn't have thought to do this, and I would have been put off. But it goes to show that um, the combination of optimism and the kind of skills that particle physics brings can be really powerful. Anyway, this is a cute accumulation of work started with Ronnie Jansen, who is a student here, and I'm sorry I don't have a picture of him. Um, in, I think we started in 2007 when WMAP first announced that they had polarized synchrotron emission data. And suddenly I realized that we could perhaps use this. And he was, I, I remember very much saying to him, you know, it's a pretty long shot, but you'll learn a lot even if we fail. And he said, well, I'm ready to try it. So we, it's an odyssey. And now um, Deepak Karana is soon going to finish his thesis. And I'll tell you what he's been doing on it. Uh, Nephew Nawal has been doing an aspect of work that's not uh, discovering the magnetic field, but making use of it. Uh, Report that. And, and um, Mikhail Unger is visiting for two years uh, from Karlsruhe. And he is up there. <laughs> I don't have a picture of him either. Anyway, uh, he's working on it, the next generation. Um, okay, so this is the problem. I mean, there, the, so you all know that we live in a spiral galaxy, and it sort of looks like those, and um, you would expect there to be magnetic field out there. Stars have magnetic field. When they have supernovas, they explode and pollute the environment, so to speak, with magnetic field. Um, there may be primordial magnetic fields. Um, anyway, generically, you'd expect them to be out there. But um, the question is, how would you figure out what they are? Locally, uh, there's, in, in fact, extremely interesting measurements right outside our heliosphere and stuff like that. This is a view, I just happened to cross it, of the what... I'm going to have to sort of reorganize my location here, I think, so I can be outside. Um, this is what it looks like from the International Space Station um, looking toward the center of the galaxy. That's the galactic disk. And that just shows uh, how big the Earth is. Anyway, that's not the way telescopes look at it. This I put on um, for orientation. It's a kind of classic textbook kind of a picture of the spiral disk. And astronomers have been busy for many years and they've worked out uh, this arm structure, and there's names for the different arms, and uh, if you follow it around, you realize that they didn't think that these necessarily connected and so on. Um, this is a sch schematic picture that's mainly derived from information about the motion of clouds of, of uh, hydrogen and that you can observe from the lines what the motion is and, and get a sort of 3D picture. So this is in the galactic. This is a picture sort of perspective artist rendition of what the galactic plane looks like. Right. Um, and the sun is here, eight and a half kiloparsecs, 25,000 light years from the center. So the, and, and this is uh, an example of what it looks like from where we are uh, with different measuring instruments looking at the center of the galaxy. You see the galactic disk, and that's the center of the galaxy, but what it looks like is totally different depending on what wavelength you look at it. Um, it. It's all optical at this point. There are no neutrinos or cosmic rays that we can differentiate that come from the galactic plane. This is going from the radio. This is 
emission of atomic hydrogen. This is uh, a different frequency radio emission. It's molecular hydrogen. You see, it really looks quite different. And that's because different structures emit in different uh, frequencies. This is mid-infrared, which is sensitive to dust. And you see how it's concentrated so differently. There's a lot of dust in the arms. Um, the, that's an optical picture. And you see it looks like you're looking through a cloud of smoke. And it's because you essentially are. The dust that gets made by stars exploding pollutes the environment. And it, it's really like smoke. Um, then this is an x-ray picture. where you, X-rays, of course, penetrate stuff. Uh, the, Certain types of sources show up there, especially. And then this is in gamma rays. Um, this doesn't the obviously. The picture was optical? Yes, it was just with the camera. So that was that. Yes, except it, right. And in fact, if you go back, you see it looked sort of dusty. And so that would be kind of looking at this view. It was a funny picture. Um, Um, let me talk to you offline because I'm going to run out of time anyway. Um, but the problem is, you know, how do you translate that knowledge into knowing what the magnetic field is, right? The magnetic field is over there, and what does it do for you? You can't carry a magnetometer around with you. Um, anyway, so the, the idea that Ronnie and I pursued made use of... There's a number of different things that are sensitive to the local magnetic field, But they all have problems, in my view, except for these two that we use. I can explain to you. They also have advantages, but the drawbacks uh, outweigh the advantages for this first start. We wanted to use two different uh, types of observables. And since you're not, you know this physics, but you're not astronomers, so I better review it. So Faraday showed that if you have a magnetized medium with free electrons, or electrons uh, that can Well, for example, if you had a gas of electrons, like because you had ionized gas, which is really characteristic of the galaxy, then if you have a polarized light beam with some frequency going through, the plane of polarization of the light gets rotated as it goes through this field until it's got some new angle of rotation, new direct orientation of rotation. And... The important thing is that the amount of rotation depends on the product of the electron density in here, the, the you know, free electrons, not, not ones in atoms, times the parallel component of the magnetic field. And then the amount by which it rotates is, goes like the square of the wavelength. So if you make an observation of something, so you sit over, well, either end. Supposing light was uh, emitted over here by a very distant quasar, far from our galaxy, but it happened to be polarized. Of course, you don't know the direction it was polarized, but in the course of propagating from the source to us, it will get its rotation, its, its angle of polarization rotated by an amount that depends on the wavelength. So if you measure that But the original polarized source is emitting many different wavelengths, but all with the same angle. So therefore, by measuring the angle of rotation at many different wavelengths, you can figure out this product. Of course, what you really figure out is a line integral of that product all the way back to the source. So that's why nobody, you know, why why a naive person would have said this is useless, um, or an unoptimistic person. Okay, so the other thing we're going to use is um, the synchrotron emission that's actually produced in the galaxy. So uh, jumping a little ahead, what we're going to argue is that we can constrain in every direction the line of sight parallel field weighted by this electron density, which we have to discuss how well we know it. And then by this other observable, we'll get a constraint on the transverse component. So you remember that synchrotron, uh, an accelerating charge will emit uh, radiation. If it's accelerating and relativistic, and say accelerating in a circle, for example, then the radiation, this is a radiation field if it's moving slowly, but if it's relativistic, that radiation is beamed and it's instantaneously along the trajectory, just tangential to its motion. 
And so if we're sitting here, every time the electron passes, we'll get a little beam of that light. So that produces essentially radiation with a characteristic frequency, uh, which turns out to often be in the radio. Um, and it's got the property that the emission is somewhat polarized. It's not completely polarized. It's a little complicated to analyze, so I'm not going to go into it any more than here. But it's got the property that the polarization is perpendicular to the magnetic field, and it's in the plane of the sky, of course, because it's transverse to the direction of the propagating electromagnetic field. Its strength is proportional to the number density of these relativistic electrons called cosmic ray electrons. You'll see this notation N sub C R E a lot. It's just shorthand for relativistic electrons. And there's a lot of them in the galaxy too. Weighted by the transverse uh, magnetic field. And it turns out to a good approximation, it's the transverse field squared. I don't want to go into more details because it's, it's, it's complicated. Anyway, as a result, the synchrotron emission, so there's a lot of electrons, there's magnetic field, they're rot- spiraling around everywhere in the galaxy, and the galaxy is emitting this synchrotron emission, which is a foreground. The reason it's very well measured is it's a foreground to looking for cosmological signatures of the early universe through the CMB, and it's been uh, measured by WMAP, that's what we use, because that was all that was available then. In the next generation will use Planck. And you've been reading about it in the paper when you read about the dust emission that was background uh, and bicep and all that. Well, the other big component that people worry about is the synchrotron emission. So by doing uh, careful observations, they've uh, gotten a nice map of the synchrotron emission from the galaxy. Now, the synchrotron emission from the galaxy is a combination of a polarized component and an unpolarized component. They're both useful for our purposes, but for what I'm going to focus on today, it's the polarized component that matters. And the polarized component can be characterized by two observables that Stokes found a very handy way to describe all of this through Stokes parameters. If any of you, uh, some of you will remember the notation. So Q and U, and you can understand that basically a polarized emission will have two things you have to know about it the strength of the emission, and its orientation. So there are two observables. How it's encoded in these two particular observables is kind of complicated, so I'm not going to try to go into that. uh, Yes? That's for a given direction of the the magnetic field. So over there in that volume of of the galaxy that's this big, the electron spiraling in there around the magnetic field over there, produces a component uh, along this, then that gets added to the one that's in front of it and the one that's behind it and so on. So you get a line integral. Each, um, each volume contributes, each volume in a given solid angle can, has a volume that's bigger by r squared, the distance it is away, and then the flux drops like one over r squared. So in a solid angle, every different radial unit will give a contribution that is only related to the cosmic ray electron density and be per squared in that element. And there's no additional funny weightings from the distance. But so it's a... How, H, how B varies as a yep, physics, yep. part of the model. Yep. And so a priori, you might really worry that you could learn anything because it could be just such an incredibly complicated headache. That's why I uh, <laughs> was really glad that, that Ronnie was ready to be, uh, you know, go for an adventure. But I think it's a, it would have been a great project anyway, but it's even greater when we learn something so dramatic. So basically what we have, uh, at the, there's around 40,000 extragalactic quasars whose rotation measures have been measured. And they're distributed over all the sky. And that's more or less one per square degree. Um, each one of, that's a, sorry, there's a typo here. It should be from uh, basically f- from us to infinite, to where the thing is, but it's extragalactic. Um, and then we have these, so WMAP is also very high resolution, around one degree pixels. There's Q and U, there's two observables, so there's roughly. Uh, twice 40,000 pixels of information on this. And because of 
fact, this is sensitive to the line of sight component of the field, and this is sensitive to the transverse component of the field. You already start to see that it's better than just using uh, this, for example. People prior to our work had made models in the disk um, and attempted to use RMs to work out the field in the disk, and there were models of the, of the disk. Um, people had not been, um, I don't know really why, but anyway, they were less interested in the halo. Um, of course, there's this ringer, potentially, of these skies. Uh, they've been modeled, and so we use the existing best models, um, and they're constrained by data and so on. But for the minute, let me put that aside. We'll continue pretending they're, they're, they're well known, and then I'll talk about the, the uh, uncertainties that generates. So even if you knew the electron density and the cosmic ray electron density, um, there's the question of what model do you put in? Because the name of the game is there's many, many, many different lines of sight. There's a whole lot of foreground. There's individual supernovae remnants that have got a lot of magnetic field. There's a lot of irregularities that are superimposed on what may be a weak uh, coherent signal. And the question is, can you pull out that signal? So what you need is, um, so the idea is, supposing there is some simple structure to the magnetic field of the galaxy, um, would we be able to discover it? And you know, what, what, what should you, how should you model it? Um, the problem, we had these, this drawback that there was no real theory of where it comes from, and so we didn't know, have that to rely on. Um, it was not obvious what form to use, uh, so that was a little bit of a challenge. Um, so we said to ourselves, well, let's put in magnetic flux conservation. Interestingly, that had not been put in before in any of the models. So that's, that's a uh, novelty, at least. Um, and then using external galaxies, uh, we could get some ideas of what to include. So this, for example, is a side-on view of another disk galaxy, or ed excuse me, edge-on view. So it's looking through the plane of the disk. And you see this evidence for, and this is, this is a radio image of the polarized emission transformed so these lines would be along the direction of the magnetic field. And you see there's an indication of some kind of a structure. And what I think everybody has imagined until our work that this was, was there are these things called winds, um, like some very massive explosion, or just, just the fact that there's a lot of hot gas, uh, hot, this, it's not all gas, but in any event, the, stuff blows up and it shoots out and this galaxy is rotating and so it's natural enough that it would go out sort of from the center and so on. And that's what you might expect. And if you had some turbulent field like from this local environment around us, this predominantly random field, it would get stretched out. And if you had a random field and you blew it out, then you'll get a what I want to call a striated field in the course of the talk, namely field that's kind of like this. It's not random, it's not unoriented, um, but it averages to zero. So the rotation measure was a line integral of the parallel field and something that's like this will average to zero, on, on average. <laughs> um, but it will affect, it'll show up in synchrotron emission because it's got a definite value of the magnitude of the perpendicular field and, and an orientation and the perpendicular field squared is what comes into the synchrotron emission. So the assumption was that what we were seeing here was some sort of projection of some, what well, I'm going to start calling a striated random field. Yeah? This is super basic, but why is it easy to observe a magnetic field in other galaxies but not our own? Oh, well, we will argue, but it's, it's like, um, all the, like the pictures of the galaxy I started with. You can see the structure because it's out there. What we see internally, I mean, in fact, what we've done is we will argue that it's possible to infer the field, but our sight lines um, are sort of going every which way, whereas you get some external galaxy at some small thing, and you notice that all the lines are like 
you know, in one direction or another direction. Sorry, what's, the, like, what's the signal that you should read it off of this other galaxy? What they did is they measured the radio emission in the wave bands where they were pretty confident it was dominated by the synchrotron emission. And by the formula for the synchrotron emission... Oh, it's weighted, and we expect there's electrons in there. And so in order to interpret it, they assumed that the energy density in cosmic rays was equal to the energy density in B perp, and that it was constant in some region. And that's how they interpreted their data, it's an excellent question, to draw it like that. Um, and so it's not that you couldn't do that with our galaxy, it's just that when you do that, you make a mistake. Which they no, it's just that there's too many li- I mean, it's just a different story, because, well, I'll, I'll show you what we do for the galaxy, and maybe that'll answer your question. Um, in principle, you could also use Faraday rotation, but these things are so little that there's not enough extragalactic quasars behind them to get a significant number of lines of sight. Anyway, there's also some face-on galaxies, and it's a little hard to see, but this is an example of one whose spiral arms are evident, but and the lines of the magnetic field are sort of along the spiral arms, but this shows that it doesn't have to be like that. Um, this is, um, you know, maybe a projection of something like this. It just happens to dominate that. Or maybe it's just, you know, going out like that or something. Anyway, so the, there's a real zoo of behavior in other galaxies. Did I? Oh, I, I may have destroyed one of my slides. I had the feeling that I had done something weird just as, before I came down here. Well, in any event, in our model, which I'll describe back, we, so the, we had a 22-parameter description of the coherent field. It sounds like 22 parameters a lot, but it's actually not when you start to think about it and count it up. And I'll tell you what they are. But one of the innovations was we allowed for there to be a field that's emanating from the disk, a so-called poloidal field, and with both a coherent and a striated part. It was almost an accident we put in the coherent part just it was more convenient to, to do it that way because we had coherent fields everywhere. A combination of coherent and striated fields, we allowed for there to be both. Um, but the sort of a priori assumptions were so strong that there would be no coherent field, we might have left it out. What a shame that would have been. Um, okay, so this is the data we used. Um, this is... a. Uh, 40,000 roughly rotation measures. There's a region here where the data is not public. There's a guy in Bonn, and well, there's a group, but anyway, this PI has been sitting on this for years trying to get the accuracy better. I keep saying to him, you know, we need it so desperately. But anyway, uh, and, and so you immediately start to see that there's a large scale structure. Um, this we've averaged the 40,000 square degree. Uh, the original data, roughly speaking, um, into 13.4 square degree pixels. Um, so you can sort of see how much that smooths it. And this is the Stokes parameter Q and U measure by WMAP. Um, now, some of this is random. And, you know, a given little thing like that is probably random sort of all by itself. You know, there's another one that looks sort of random. Because supernovae really have a lot of magnetic field. Um, I mean, the, the remnants. So the challenge becomes, how do you pull out a co- correctly the coherent structure? Uh, so what we did, one of our two major, I would say, um, conceptual <laughs> breakthroughs, which in retrospect look totally trivial, um, is that we could, in every one of these 13.4 square degree pixels, we had uh, 16 subpixels with one degree squared for which we had data. And so we could just measure the variance in each of those pixels. And that's what this map shows down here. Uh, unfortunately, this one, I didn't have it quickly at hand, an unmasked view. But what you would imagine is true is that in this, in this uh, galactic plane region, there's a huge variance. Um, that's why WMAP 
advocated using a mask. And what I'll show you is that it turned out the result didn't depend on the mask, otherwise one wouldn't have had confidence in it. Could you explain how these pictures relate to the previous one? Oh, this is, this, okay, the previous one was the one uh, of the external galaxy. This, this one you're referring to, sorry, this one? Okay, so that's really a distant galaxy, a little thing, and we're looking at it. No, no, in the next one, it's like a map that you had in your grammar school class that's meant to show the whole globe. I'm awfully glad you asked that because I'm so used to looking at them. So this is a 300, this is a four pi view of the sky where there's a mapping from every different direction on the sky into this what's called a Molawati projection, which has equal areas. Um, No, the previous one was simply on the sky. It would be like one degree. It's a little thing. It's a distant galaxy. Why is it just one of those? No, because this is is dominated. Of course, those very distant things will contribute to this. But this is really dominated by the galactic stuff. But I I, I will return to that issue. Actually, they don't, usually they don't bother because they don't know it. Yeah. Now, in fact, using our field, I'm constantly getting these requests now. You know, compute this for us that we can subtract. <laughs> but before that, they couldn't. Oh, so this includes the, the galactic well, let me, let me, which dominates let, over what in the previous here, year, right? Let me, let me uh, address it better since you raised it. The Stokes emission Q and U is by construction from WMAP, the galactic component, because they have a procedure of looking at the emission in many different wavelengths in order to pick out the part that is synchrotron emission, and there's just no significant... I mean, the dom- by, by far, the dominant synchrotron emission is local. So this is really being made by the galaxy. Here, it's rather different. We have these extragalactic sources, which can have their own intrinsic RM. They have, each one has a magnetic environment. So each one of them has a piece of RM. The reason we can do this is those are totally uncorrelated. And so as long as we know the variance associated with that, and the variance coming from the very... uh, the pieces in the direction of the galaxy where there's a lot of action, we can properly uh, weight the contributions of the different regions. So let me give as an example, um, for example, this thing here is that structure, or maybe not that one. Um, If I showed you the total emission, not the polarized emission, which was actually in, in that multi-wavelength plot, there were big arcs and stuff called the northern spur and things. So in synchrotron emission, you really see like the outlines of supernova remnants and stuff like that. So there's definitely random local stuff on top of this. But the important point is that we measure the variation um, in each pixel, and that's therefore capturing the intrinsic astrophysical variance. The uh, observational variance is very, very small. There's essentially no observational uncertainty. And what you see is the amount of variance away from the galactic disk is much greater. And this variance that is still here, it's not zero, although relatively speaking it's really tiny, is the natural variance from one extragalactic quasar to another of its RM. Okay, I should move on. Um, So the scheme is that for every pixel, you uh, this is the data. So for every pixel, you 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 have your model with say 22 parameters, and so for one particular value of those parameters, you get a prediction for what the map would be like if that was the correct model. And so for that particular value of the parameters you can compute the difference between, and now sum up over every single pixel. Uh, So in every pixel, you sum up uh, the difference between the data and the model prediction with those parameters, square it, and you divide by the variance 
in that pixel. You sum it up, and you get a chi-squared. You use that, it's of course not a real chi-squared, um, because there's, you, you don't have that much, well, I won't go into it, but it has to do with the, the math. In any event, you get um, a figure of merit, and the best, map, uh, the best model would have the smallest value. And you, you sum the values up for the different uh, observables. And then you minimize over all the different possible parameter values you could have. And in a way, the miracle was that there was a well-defined minimum, and there really is. So our model, just to, to let you know about it, we, we adopted the geometry that people had, had constructed for the spiral arm. There's eight arms whose width was fixed as far as we were concerned. So we took this geometry as fixed, and we just fit for the different field strengths asking that they all sum up to be zero so that the flux you know, was coming in and going out and it was conserved within the disk. And then above the, above the plane, we allowed there to be a toroidal component um, and a, below the plane, a, a, also a toroidal component, we allowed them to have different strengths and signs and different scale heights and different radial widths and so on. And then this is a so-called X field, the out-of-plane field. It turned out not to be so trivial, although now uh, there's people who have developed analytic expressions that are smoother. But we needed a form that was not a dipole. It's way too compact, it turned out. Um, but we needed it to be kind of like that. And so there was a question of how to write the field in a way that would capture the kind of shape that was suggested by those external galaxies and still be divergent free. Um, and then, by the way, this isn't showing the, this isn't a field strength thing because the density of these lines, is, this is just showing you the direction, but this is showing you the field strength. Anyway, that was a model. There were uh, some 21 or 22 parameters. I mentioned the RMs we used. This, I'm not gonna dwell on this in detail. One thing we did is in certain regions, it was possible because people had a technique for measuring what was the foreground contribution. They could measure that of this amount that was seen, this much was due to the foreground. And so you could do the analysis subtracted. And we did it with and without the subtraction and got the same answer. And that's, that really gave us confidence in the method. Yeah. Which parameters? Well, they're not. They're. they're uh, well, I'll show you the numbers. But the, the they're certainly in the realm. In the realm. I mean, whether something is 0.1 or 0.15 in terms of the, the thickness in kiloparsecs, that would be a debatable. But in fact, it's an interesting question now. You know, to go back and look to see how close they, they match the different disks. Uh, Certainly, in the it's a sort of you know physically plausible kind of values. Um, this is the same thing for the synchrotron emission. I mentioned the map. So WMAP had a, ma a mask when they do their own analyses. Uh, we tried a more conservative mask. We tried different masks, and then we tried a totally unmask. And it turned out that the fit parameters changed by less than one sigma. And that's a real vindication of the methodology that putting in these weights with the variance really helps you capture the field. Um, this is the electron density, the cosmic ray electron density, which is pain. But um, I mentioned the striated component. That's the sort of visualization of it. Um, we, I won't go too much into the details of the modeling, just to try to, I want to save room for a time for the pictures. Uh, of, of cosmic ray motion in this field. Move along. Okay, so this is the basic model parameters uh, for the coherent and striated field. And each one of these b little b's is the field strength at a five kiloparsec radius in each spiral arm, but this is easier to visualize. The colors tell you that in, one, in some arms it's going in and in some arms it's going out. Recently, uh, Deepak Karana has lifted this requirement that this, they have to sum up and, and produced a model where they could, it could be exiting in the halo. 
and w found that in fact it, it's it, this is the because we Ronnie and I had imposed that the field adds to zero in the disk, and so of course it's got to be coming in, and you know it's got to have both signs. But I'll mention in it later that for theoretical reasons, many people who think about the theory of this didn't think it should be going in in one place and coming out, that it should all have the same direction. Um, anyway, the field strengths are of order of a few microgauss. The, one of the most interesting things, or the, the really exciting result, was that this so-called X field, the out-of-component one, is quite strong. It's about five, uh, five microgauss in the center. The colors here are all, uh, you know, they're sort of in proportion to each other. I mean, they're, they're the same color scale. Um, and it's a directed field. It's from south to north. Um, and the striated field is as strong as the coherent field, roughly speaking. The... Uh, Oh, here the, the parameters are amazingly well constrained. These are the worst constrained parameters. This is something to do with the uh, width of the transition region between the disk and the halo. This is the width of the southern uh, toroidal field. So it's, it's, not, it's very poorly constrained. But most of the others are quite well constrained. This is a measure of how precisely thing it's, it's defined. It's hard to say when you have such a high dimensional parameter space how, um, how uncertain things are or not. But this is an example of how much the cosmic rays deflections would differ if you just sampled this random, this parameter space according to its probability distribution, which the likelihood Monte Carlo method that we used Samples. Anyway, it's less than a degree or of order degree. So they're very well constrained parameters. The thing that was really the, the has been becoming more and more clear is a really very exciting and unexpected result. Well, in a certain sense, unexpected. Nobody had tried modeling it, but of course, everybody realized it could be like that. Is that there could be a, an out of plane component? And as I said, we found though that it was actually coherent and not just a random one. And the structure is like an opening helix. This is a, I, I was hoping to get a better one that they were working on for us. But you can kind of see, if you, you can sort of see the field lines um, spiraling around. And they spiral around in the direction that they should if you had a coherent field ab initio that was sort of poloidal field and the galaxy was rotating. That will generate, from differential shear, that will generate an orientation to the spiral and that's what's observed. I mean, that's what we, can, we found. Um, this is a, the, these were the data that we, Well, just, I would not sure I would want to call that dynamo because the dynamo suggests that it's a sort of exponential amplification. It could be that it was a primordial thing and it gradually, or, and not so necessarily so primordial. But that's something I'll get back to. But that's a really interesting question that is now hotly debated because, as I'll come back to the question of the origin. But you're absolutely right in your intuition that the structure is not obvious unless there's a pre existing. Thing. Anyway, this is just to show you how well we do fitting the data. As I said, when we did it, we used this conservative mask, um, but then it turned out that no mask was necessary because this method of, of deweighting pixels, which had a high variance, just works fine. And you certainly see that qualitatively it, it, it looks pretty good. Let me show you, this is with the unmasked data, where it's easier to look at. Um, this data, as I said, just missing. Uh, this funny splotch is really an artifact of this electron density, which may or may not be correct. Um, and you see these big patterns. And it turns out, and I think I won't take the time for this, it was really Deepak who kind of was able to show sharply that this is true, is this structure that tells you that the that it's this spiral directed field. 
as opposed to just a striated random field. Um, uh, sorry, that, that you have the, the, ex, the, the poloidal component. Without the poloidal component, you just can't get that. In a way, that's easier to see by looking at... Oh, here, this shows you what, it, what the field would be like, what the prediction... So this is the data. This is uh, running in my model. And then this is what the prediction would look like if the halo field were purely striated, like it was coming from these winds, like I mentioned at the beginning, where there was a turbulent field and it got stretched out, and it didn't have an overall coherent component. And that's what it would look like. And you see that they really, they totally, totally unacceptable fit. Um, This is just to illustrate the, the, this is the prediction, this is the data predictions of our model. This is the predictions of the uh, previous models, the, the pre- best previous models. And you see they're just totally different from the data qualitatively. Um, part, the, the, this failure to capture this asymmetry pattern is because they don't have the uh, coherent out-of-plane field. Okay, this is what we would look like to an extragalactic observer, you know, just to compare with this. Oh, this is two, extra gal- two other galaxies. But to an extragalactic observer, we would look pretty similar. Faison and Ejon. Um, so on the possible origin of the field, it's easy to understand the striated component. They could be there's two mechanisms, actually. One is that there was a sort of coherent field that got smushed by cause of supernova, for example, or something exploded. I'm not going to go into detail about why this is. these are the options. And then I had already mentioned that you have a turbulent field and it gets stretched or compressed. So striated fields are not difficult to understand. I actually think the data in different regions favors both of these mechanisms uh, being at play, but I'm not going to go into that. Um, getting, to me, getting a disk field with reversals seems really quite hard because imagine you had a little bit of field in the disk for some reason, some fluctuation, and then the, the galaxy rotates and rotates. It's re- the galaxy has rotated several hundred times since it started forming. And so that field would be just so wound up, it's going to look toroidal. So something else is going on if we have these sort of in and out. Now, there's a possibility that if everything started sort of recently, like as a dynamo, if there was a field like this, and then that got twisted, you can work it out in your head, that would create this shape. But that all seems like it has to be so recent. So the whole question of the origins of the structure are very mysterious. But the data, both, both for the, the shape of the spiral fields. People have known, by the way, about these reversals for a long time. Our spiral, our, our disk model is not very different from previous models. So this was known. I don't think people had sort of focused on how it could originate. Um, and so this problem, or, or the sort of conceptual question of what would give rise to that on the time scales that seem relevant hasn't been much addressed. Um, Here's some pictures of people trying to simulate the magnetic field. And these are all totally random. They don't get a coherent field at all. Getting this helical halo field, one thing that does work is if you had a wispy pregalactic field that was just um, a tenth of a nanogauss over a a megaparsec range, which is a kind of typical number people would make up. Um, for, from structure formation. Then as the material falls in to make the galaxy, it gives you just sort of the right size. Uh, then a question would raise, you know, would, would that still be intact so long afterwards with all this stuff falling in, which we know from cosmological simulations is falling in. As I said, if that was there, then the rotation would naturally give the right s- shape for this opening helical field. But again, 
is it twisted the right amount? So there are lots of really, really great theoretical questions. I think we're getting to where we um, can start to... Now, now, that, now that there's a pretty clear structure, it's time for theory to try to address it. Um, this is just to mention the caveats. Certainly, uh, these two functions are not that great known. Um, here's an example of a model that's really different than the one we used. Um, and now in the next phase, we're, we're considering other functions. I think actually this data and, and other data can self-consistently... This, this method, now that we've got the method sorted out, I think it'll be very powerful and applicable actually to learn these functions themselves. Um, we'll put more theory input into the um, functional form. And... Um, okay, I've got to move on. I want to show you the movies. Um, Okay, so the origin, in a way, of of being interested in the magnetic field was that if you're interested in ultra-high-energy cosmic rays, as as you know I am, uh, they will be deflected, in principle, by the magnetic field in the galaxy. And so there's a really important question, how much are they deflected? Um, And could you conceivably understand it well enough to maybe correct for that? That seems to me almost inconceivable, but you can certainly identify certain directions where if they came from that direction, it wouldn't be very much deflected. Uh, So maybe you could look for sources. Anyway, so this is a picture of the... And this is actually not a uh, realistic picture, but the... I'm going to skip this one just because of the time um, and move to the next one, I hope. Whoops, it's going to go... Okay, so this, what I'm going to show... Now let me make sure that does start... This is a movie. And what's going to start happening is, is there too much light on it? Should I turn the light down? I'll push off. So you see the lines. Oh, it's really dark. It looks like a movie. Um, Anyway, these are cosmic rays coming in, selected at random from a large number of cosmic rays that hit the Earth uh, isotropically at a given moment. And the reason they look funny is you're seeing them penetrating into the region of simulation at different times because since they arrive at the us at the same moment, they um, had to start at different times since we're here, eight and a half kiloparsecs from the middle, and so one's coming from over here. We we made an arbitrary entry point of, I think, uh, 15 kiloparsecs from the center or something. Anyway, so one of the things you'll notice is although the cosmic rays I told you looked isotropic when we found them in this imaginary uh, experiment, they actually, uh, well, they took these trajectories. Now let's, this is, so this is the the GZK cutoff, which is where we start to just see the local universe, nearby 100 megaparsecs. Um, That occurs for particles of energies above about 60 Ecta-electron volts. So if I divide... The, and the thing that affects the deflections in magnetic fields is the energy divided by the electric charge. So Z is referring to the charge of the cosmic ray, which in general you are... It's a lot easier to measure the energy of a cosmic ray than its charge, although there are methods, and Michael Unger is one of the world's experts on developing these methods. Anyhow... The, um, if you knew the charge, then you could calculate the rigidity, and it's a rigidity you have to know to be able to, to determine or, or even uh, talk about d- making predictions for the deflections. And so this was saying, supposing you had an ultra-high energy cosmic ray that was carbon. If you had it, if the same uh, cosmic ray had been a proton, they would have been almost undeflected. But now I'm going to show you what happens, hopefully I can advance this. This is in the event that it was um, it was iron that was coming in. Again, um, and the assumption we saw it isotropically, or a proton whose energy was, was 26 times lower. Um, you start to see they really take an odd trajectory, some of them at least. And what you'll start to notice 
is that although when they arrive, by construction they arrive isotropically, because we simply subsampled a set that arrived isotropically, they predominantly came from this direction. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about that general phenomenon. Um, when the cosmic rays, imagine now a plane transverse to the direction to a distant source. The cosmic rays are sort of forming a plane wave. Now, depending on where they hit in that transverse plane, they'll experience different magnetic deflections. And it can happen that different patches of that plane can focus the cosmic rays down on us. And this is just for 10 randomly chosen directions. Here, for example, is just bigger, the same sort of thing. If the source was in that direction, the parts of the transverse plane, and this is one and a half kiloparsecs away from where it would have come through if it was undeflected, or here it's, it's two, two kiloparsecs that way and a kiloparsec over. Anyway, there were three patches that could focus down on it. What that does is produce an effect, two effects that are really important. One of them is that you see, can see multiple images, and the other is that you can get strong magnification or demagnification effects because there's nothing to say that for some source directions a very large portion of the transverse plane can be focused down on us, meaning we get a big number of cosmic rays relative to what we would have gotten for the same source without the magnetic field. Um, So there's a magnification effect and there's this multiple imaging. So what this is is a series of quick images as you change the rigidity. So this corresponds to 100 EEV, ecto-electron volts, 10 to the 20th. Essentially, only a handful of cosmic rays have a higher energy than this. So if they were protons, this is a sky plot showing the magnification of sources in different directions. This doesn't tell you where the cosmic ray goes. That's on another plot. This just says if the source was in that direction, I go over here, look, this is a log scale, that source would have given us a magnification factor of 30. On the other hand, if you were right next door, you wouldn't see anything. So I'll just run through these as the rigidity gets lower and lower. Either the energy is going down or the charge is going up. And what you notice is that the red spots sort of jump around. What that tells you is that as the energy changes... A given source can have a strong magnification or even a demagnification. And you also start to see this blue spot means no cosmic rays get to us from there. That's the galactic center. The point is that the galactic center is so strongly magnetized, it just deflects cosmic rays trying to get to us. That's the effect that we were seeing in the movie where the ones that were coming to us were coming all from one side. In fact, it was coming from the direction of away from the galaxy. What's the difference between R and rigidity? Oh, R uh, was rigidity, sorry. No, but one is in volts and the other one is something called EV. Oh, this is ecto, which is 10 to the 18. So this is 6, 10 to the 18. It's just 10 to the 18.8. Sorry about that. Um, Right, if there were no magnetic field, a unit flux. And so going down, it gets. You think that you had to use also some of your early work with Aftermax, because otherwise you don't know. Oh, yes. Once you, so, so this has an effect, nothing to do in a certain sense with that whole discussion before. It's just that once you've got the magnetic field, then the assumption is you know it. So the mask that was at an issue of how to determine the magnetic field was a question of what um, synchrotron emission data was safe to use, so to speak, not polluted by too much foreground effects. This is a completely different map. Yes? So, I mean, so this is where I'm so ignorant. I don't ask a stupid question. No, it's wonderful. Presumably, we look at things and say they should be sources of cosmic rays. All right, this is... <laughs> so what you're saying is we look at that thing, the cosmic rays may, from that thing maybe appear to come from a different direction. I'm going to just get to that. Um, the first message is that if everything were coming from a single source, we would get all sorts of ups and downs in the spectrum just because of the magnification effect in general. And um, 
there's probably information in that we haven't yet. Uh, this is going to lower and lower rigidity. But this shows perhaps just that point. So supposing you had a source that was there, just for the sake of discussion. This is galactic coordinates. That's the galactic center. And this is uh, six, 60 EEV. Now, this would be like ultra-high-energy cosmic rays. I mean, this is the typical picture people would have imagined. So they are almost not deflected at all. If instead the cosmic ray was carbon, the red is how much it would be deflected. Now, the deflections depend on the coherence length of the random field. I didn't tell you, but we also made a model of the random field, the, distri- the, the way the strength of the random field, the RMS field strength of the random field is changing. Uh, you can just do that with total synchrotron emission data. But there's nothing in our analysis that lets you understand how large scale are the fluctuations. If the fluctuations are really tiny, then compared to the Larmor radius of the charged particle, then it's almost not deflected. And the, you could have a strong random field, but it doesn't affect much the propagation. But if the sort of size of the regions is big enough that you that it can start to be deflected in the subregions, then you get much more spreading. So the red here is illustrating that effect. If you have really small coherence length, tiny turbulent cells, then it's the black spots. And if you have a larger coherence length, which used to be what people thought was standards, about 100 parsecs, about the size of a supernova remnant, that was for many years what people thought. Now it's thought to be somewhere in between. But in any event, you see it's a really different picture. Interestingly, the magnification is about the same. It's just that in the small coherence length, there are really concentrated patches, little islands, whereas in the large coherence length, it's very spread out. Of Of the the, distribution of magnetic fields? Now, yes, so what I haven't told you about... Yes, this is something I need to say. Plasma physicists understand this. it's a shame. Andre didn't, doesn't read his email, so he didn't know. <laughs> I didn't think to tell him. <laughs> it would have been nice if he'd been here. Um, but anyway, what, what plasma physicists and astrophysicists know is that when there's... A, also condensed matter physics. When there's electrons free, like there are, because there's a fair fraction of the, the um, electrons are not... Uh, a fair fraction of the protons are ionized. It's like 10 to the minus 5 or something. But in any event, the... There's this charged medium and very powerful hydrodynamic turbulent effects in the galaxy from things exploding, for example. And that causes the material, I mean, physically hydrodynamic motion, but it carries the the magnetic field with it because it's frozen in due to the free electrons. So as a result, that turbulent motion tangles up the magnetic field. And it's that coherence length that's under, under discussion. And of course, when by coherence length, I mean the maximum coherence length. It's thought to be a Kolmogorov spectrum with you know, very, very, you know, but with also some power on, on small scales. But anyway, this is just to illustrate that until that's understood, even knowing the, rand, the magnetic field isn't enough to make a prediction. This was just illustrating for a few selected sources um, randomly chosen on the sky. Uh, just literally, not random, but actually just spaced out over the sky, how much the magnification factor is changing. Um, And it depends on, it has more variation in different parts of the uh, sky. I think I should really move on. I, 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 Michal scolds me, uh, because actually the biggest deviations that are quite significant from a smooth line are, are down in here. But they're in, invisible. It's just that there's so much data. Uh, the number of events is so big. But this is the Auger spectrum, clearly showing the cutoff, uh, a cutoff, whether it's due to maximum power of the sources or the GZK effect. In any event, you do see these, these um, points that are quite a bit off the line, not enough to claim some three sigma deviation, but I can't help but wonder whether it might be some magnification effect. Oh, this is just showing, uh, I'll just flip through this. This is 
I, I go back here. This is one of my favorite directions because in that direction, there's four events that are known from uh, to be within a, about a degree of each other and a rather an interesting source. And then if you said, what about the lower rigidity stuff from there? Where would it wind up? <laughs> it just winds up they're all over the place. Um, this is just to illustrate. I, and this is one of the most popular sources for all trimetry cosmic rays because it's a um, it's called Centaurus A and it's only four megaparsecs away. It's the nearest powerful um, radio galaxy AGN to us. And so actually I mentioned this because many of you know Sveep Farhan and he spent a sabbatical at NYU and uh, he and I argued that this could be the source. It was one of the first arguments. That's why I mentioned it. But in any event, it's a popular source. Where would it look like the cosmic rays were coming from? Well, depending on their charge and their rigidity, um, it's on their rigidity, this is where they would look like they were coming from. So what you see is that, in answer for your question, Mark, you have to have some control on the charge. I'll go back so we can see each other. You have to have some control on the charge to try to look for sources. One possibility, I I don't believe that if it's a high charge and low rigidity, it would be possible to predict the deflection well enough, although maybe you could do statistical stuff. But what you could do is if you could argue that for sure some particular cosmic ray, or not for sure, but at like 90% confidence level, it was a proton and it was from a region and it was high energy, and it was a region of the sky where you thought you could control the magnetic field, then you could use those to do sources. And OJ is upgrading to be able to do that. Okay, on to the last movie. Uh, this is if you had a source in the galaxy, and it went off. This is Nephun Amal's uh, work. He's a graduate student here. Many of you know him, I hope. And so this is a movie showing if a cosmic, an explosion happened at the galactic center how would the cosmic rays stream out? And one of the things you notice, you do notice, by the way, they're spiraling around the magnetic fields. It's not spherically symmetric. Um, One can't help but wonder if something like this is is playing a role in the Fermi bubbles. Share that. What else can I show you? The next one, I'll move along. I love watching the spiral. They look like little wiggly things. This is... um, that's the galactic center. This is us. At, or, or, <laughs> this is at eight and a half kiloparsecs. This, uh, <laughs> in any event, not the, the diameter is not the scale, obviously. And so, if if that if a source went off there, what would it look like? What did I do? No, I went back somehow. Whoops. Uh, yes. So this is 100,000 years to spread out that much. That's the one you saw before. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I seem to be incompetent. In this. Rather than try to correct my mistake, I think you have to live through it. Um, I was trying to make it advance and leave this one before it was done. I got impatient, and I think I maybe made it start again. Oh. Quit, 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 quit. Well, I'll start again. Okay, now this is um, a... If it happened near us, it would be five and a, eight and a half kiloparsecs from the center. What are you doing? Oh, it's giving a, a little more light. There's supposed to be a... There's no way of giving a little more light. I see. This is called atheist. <laughs> well, this is the, the, there's only one more. This is what it would look like sort of in perspective, and I think it might be the end. Um, so that's just, I'll, I'll summarize. Thank you. I, I fear I kept you too long. But... I couldn't hear you. So. Yes, they have. And so we're tooling up uh, to do a next generation analysis. 
but rather than just substitute in the plank. The best part about plank isn't the angular resolution, but the better separation of the different components and really isolating the galactic part. No, no, it's not. It's actually, actually, uh, WMAT does a better job. But what they do is they have more frequencies, and so they get a more accurate separation between what's the galactic synchrotron, what's the dust, what's the extra galactic and stuff. Yes? Yes. So I'm I'm confused about the relationship between the first part of the talk, the major part of the talk, and the second. The major part of the talk ended up by you saying, well, we have determined to the best we could, the magnet, galactic magnetic field. Now let's see what its effect is on cosmic rays. Right. But if indeed it is a turbulent field, what was that thing? Was oh. it a snapshot? No, sorry. It's a combination. So you're asking about these last movies. So the... the, the well, I'm the, asking... You're, uh, let me let me paraphrase your question. Snapshot. There's the oh the this one back here. This this picture here. The, the, um, the, the oh, I'm never. No, the upshot was you showed this magnetic field, which was what was. Oh wait, current. in fact, it was in the last. It was in the last slide. Um, the, let me just. I I think I can answer your question. Oh, this one here. Is this the one you mean? So what? Let me. I'll summarize. It's 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 good to summarize coherently. Um, we discovered that there is a coherent field whose strength is substantial. Uh, it's, and in addition, sorry, that part is coherent, and the part that's so there's three components to the field. Um, I emphasized the coherent one because that was so unexpected. Um, the in addition, superimposed on that, there is a turbulent field, which is in fact quite strong in the disk. And we were also the first to model that in detail using the similar technique. We were able to separate them out. I just didn't want to go into that much detail. So we also have a model of how the field strength of the random component is varying. And we were able to separate that there are these three different components. The propagation models show the effect of everything. For the ones that are coming in you know, from outside the galaxy or from high in the galactic plane, the most important effect is the coherent one. For the ones that get near the galactic plane, where the random field is very strong um, in some regions, then the this sort of spewing out effect, I think of it as like putting a hose of water against a fan almost, um, then that becomes really important. And the coherence you were talking about refers to, to that. To the a coherence length had to do with what's the natural largest size of the turbulence in the random field. In the random field. Part. Right. Thank you for getting that clear. Oh. But I. Yes, yes, I, I went through that really fast. But what I, uh, in fact, the chi square per degree of freedom in our model is something like 1.08. It's amazing for a model with 22 parameters and 10,000 degrees of, you know, 10,000 observables to have that good at chi squared. The reason I didn't want to insist that it should be one or whatever, it's, it's really most useful for the relative meaning. The reason is that we had to make a sort of arbitrary decision of do we weight the different data sets so that each data set has a, the same weight or it's proportional to the number of data points and stuff like that. So there's a little ambiguity in what the price is, but it's a astoundingly good fit. And then if we do things like, I, I show quickly a question, all of the variables except one, which is the, how rapidly it spreads in the south, are uh, remarkably well constrained. And then when you ask how strong do the uncertainties in the field by itself affect things like the cosmic ray deflections are quite small. That's assuming everything was correct, but of course it's the unknown unknowns that get you here because there well, were- I was thinking you could try uh, uh, some kind of Monte Carlo like we would in particle physics uh, where you uh, generate a simulated set of fields with some parameters, say, and see if you can recover it. Nafune did, uh, uh, not Nafune, uh, uh, 
<laughs> Wonderful. Uh, Deepak did that to confirm that we could get it out. But the trouble with doing much of that is that the really uncertain stuff is this electron density and the cosmic ray electron density. Maybe in, in a few years when we've self-consistently done that too, then it'll really make sense to do that kind of proper analysis. But I think it's a triumph of particle physics type of approach, frankly. Okay, if no more urgent questions, Thank you. Thank you.